Hi, everyone. Welcome to our very first Tech Talk uh, made by Howdy. Uh, today, we are going to listen to David Obregón, who is going to do this really interesting Tech Talk. So I will leave you with him. Please enjoy it. Bye bye, guys. Hello, everyone. I hope you guys can hear me well. Let's start. Today, I'm very happy to be here in front of you. First, to celebrate the Developers Day, and second, to share and talk about that topic that many of you are experts, but there are other people that are just starting to get in about that topic. Today, we are going to talk about functional design, and we will explore the principles of functional design in software development. In order to start with this, I want you to participate in my presentation. So please go to slido.com and enter that code because I will ask you some questions and you will have time to ask me some questions. So this is the agenda for today. First, we are going to talk about the challenge of object-oriented programming. Then we will define what is functional programming and we will talk about the principles and why functional programming is mystified. Probably we will demystify what is functional programming and we will explain it in a simple and easy way to understand. Third, we are going to talk about the pros and cons. Then we will answer this question. Does functional programming work or definitely this doesn't work? And finally, we will discuss the future of functional programming. All right. Let's start. First of all, let me introduce myself. I am David. I have worked at Howdy approximately for two years, and I have 10 years of experience as a software developer. So I want to start my presentation with this phrase. Anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or 80. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. The greatest thing in life is to keep your mind young. Henry Ford. So I think that's the reason why I look like I am 18 years old. No, just kidding. I just want to encourage you all to never stop learning. If you are just starting in this amazing path of a developer or you are an expert, you should continue learning every day. That is my message. I just want you to come home today and say, hey, today, I learned something new. I am sure you will learn something new today. That is my purpose today. All right. So when I started to read and research about functional programming, I found in different places, in different articles, this phrase, forget everything you know about programming or forget everything you think you know about programming. But let's see what we really know about programming. Please help me to answer this question. What words or concepts come to mind when you think of object-oriented programming? Help me to answer that because we need to know what are we going to forget, right? So please take some time to answer this question. Inheritance, classes, objects, instances, yeah. Those are great words. Read it, okay. Come on, come on. I know you have more words in mind. Come on. Abstraction, isolation, encapsulation. Yeah. <laughs> Monkey banana problem. Yeah, that's a good one a way to describe a problem and its environment. 
best practices. Okay, those are great words. So my question is, should we really forget all that? Should we really forget things like comments, data structures, conditionals, indentation, for example? Uh, I am not sure about that. Are you sure about that? Well, we will explore in this conversation, why I don't believe that this phrase is true. So, I must admit that I am an object-oriented programmer. Why? Because 10 years ago, I started as a c -sharp developer and as a C++ developer, and I have worked in many projects as an object-oriented programmer. But then, suddenly, I publish a survey to choose between a topic between data restraints and functional programming, and you guys choose functional programming. So I need to take off my object-oriented programming hat, and then I need to talk about the object-oriented programming from a different perspective. These are just some examples of things that are probably confusing and adding complexity to object-oriented programming, frame class, virtual function, covariant return type. These are just concepts that I took from Wikipedia. And let's take a look, for example, at, at covariant return type. In object-oriented programming, a covariant return type of a method is one that can be replaced by a narrower type when the method is overridden in a subclass. It sounds a little bit complex, right? But it's easy to understand. Basically, it's saying that I can modify the type of a method that I am inheriting as a shell class. Well, yeah, it adds a lot of complexity. And what about a frame class? Yeah, two classes can be friends. And I think a frame class is just a way to break one of the things that you mentioned, the encapsulation. Yeah. A frame class is just a way to use or call private or protected methods, even though they were defined as are private and protected. So if I define a frame class, I can use methods of a private class. Basically, we are breaking encapsulation. And there are many and many examples of things that were added to object-oriented programming that are adding a lot of complexity. Let's take a look at this very common example. This is called the diamond problem. And as you can see in the screen, we have a class that is called motor vehicle and two subclasses that are inheriting from that main class, car and boat. They are overriding the star method. And finally, we have a class that is called amphibious car and it is applying multiple inheritance. It is inheriting from car and boat, and it is calling the star method. So guess what? We don't know which of the star method will be called. The one on the car or, or the one on the boat class is difficult, you know? Languages like c -sharp, yeah, I am a c -sharp fan, have fixed this problem, but other languages have not fixed this problem yet. And it just adds a lot of complexity to object-oriented programming. So over time, as requirements change and bugs are fixed, systems become harder to understand and maintain. I think maintenance is the main headache, and please correct me if I am wrong, is the main headache of the developers when we need to go to legacy code that is using object-oriented programming, and we need to maintain that application. It's very difficult. Why? Because we spend a lot of time fixing bugs, three, four, five days, fixing a bug that can be easily fixed if you just switch the position of a function, things like that. So I think we probably need a new paradigm, right? Don't you think so? And where we can find a new paradigm? 
Yeah, in the mathematics. Before I started systems engineering, I wanted to be a mathematician. Why? Because they have a good way to abstract things. They have similar problems to us. They have to design things. They have to abstract things. And normally they represent some of those things and concepts in functions. But functions in mathematics are very different to our functions, methods, or subroutines in software. Basically, in our functions, methods, and subroutines, we normally write to a file, write to a database, we print to the console, things like that. But functions in mathematics is just a concept, and it's a very basic concept. Given an input, I get an output. So given if I have one, I will get three. If I have two, I will get five. And this is very easy. This is just a function that is equals to x plus one. This is that function. And we can define that function with that notation. It's very basic. I know you guys have seen this in your mathematics classes. And also, if we are going to talk about functional programming, we need to talk about lambda calculus. And what is lambda calculus? In the early 1930s, a person or a genius called Alonso George was trying to demonstrate what can be done with a computer. Yeah, at the same time, there was another person, uh, Alan Turing, that was inventing the Turing machine in order to prove the same. What can be done with a computer? But unlike the Turing machine, Alonso Church was trying to demonstrate that with functions, okay? So what is lambda calculus? It's just a set of three single rules, variables, abstraction, and application. Variables are just placeholders that, that can define values or inputs to functions. Abstraction is just a notation that she created to define function. And the notation is just the lambda symbol that you can see there, followed by a variable, then a dot, and then an expression. And what can be an expression? An expression is just the function body. And the application is the way of how I apply that function to an argument. So following with our previous example of 2x plus 1, let's see how can we represent that function in lambda calculus. So we will define that function as lambda x dot 2x plus 1. That is our function, and that is the way to write that function in lambda notation. Pretty easy, right? And then, what if we want to apply that function to an argument 3? We just put the 3 next to the function, and we substitute 3 for x in the abstraction, and this is basically going to give us the result that is 7. This is very powerful. This is just the basics of lambda calculus, but at that time, Alonso Church demonstrated things like numbers, booleans, conditionals, etc. He demonstrated everything just with functions. This is very powerful. And how does functional programming relate to lambda calculus? Well, there are some functional programming languages like Haskell, Lisp, or Clojure. I will talk today a little bit about Clojure. Uh, that were inspired by Lambda Calculus. As you can see in the right of the slide, I am mapping from Lambda Calculus notation to a closure notation. So that the way to define functions is very, very similar. Let's see this example. If we want a function that will double a number in closure, we can define that function with that notation, fn, is a way to define anonymous function in closure. The x in the brackets is the variable, 
and the body of the function is the asterisk 2x, which means that I will multiply 2 by x. Pretty easy. Then, if we want to apply that function to the argument 3, I would write that very similar to lambda calculus. I will put the number 3 next to the function. And finally, if we run this function, it will give us that the double of 3 is equals to 6. Yeah, we have learned some very basics about closure. Then we will start with our first principle, but this looks very similar to this, right? So the base of pure function is just mathematical functions. Given an input, I apply a function and I have an output. There are no side effects. I am not going to delete a file on my functions. I am not going to update a database. I'm not going to do any network requests, etc. It is deterministic. Given the same input, if I call that function 100 times, I will get the same output 100 times. Pretty easy. And then, what if we need to do things like this? Given an array, I need to modify one of the elements of that array. In the land of mutability, you will think of modifying the array directly, which means that if I want to change that b by an x, I can do it easily. I can mutate the full bar. But what are the drawbacks of this? We can, we are causing some side effects. We can have things like race conditions that are when we have multiple things running in threads trying to get the same value of a variable. We can have overheads and we can have bugs. That is what we are trying to avoid here. In the land of immutability, well, we cannot do this. We cannot mutate the full bar. We need to make it immutable. We need to make full be the same value forever. So what are we going to do? We can create a new variable just with the value modified. But it has some problems. What if my array has 1 million of elements and I, and I don't need only to modify that variable, that value, I need to add more elements, I need to remove an element that will be a headache. Why? Because I will need to do a bunch of copies. And what is the problem with the copies? Copies has a cost of time and space. So that must be a better way of doing this in functional programming. And what is the way of doing that? Magic. This is called persistent data structures. And the basic idea of persistent data structures is that we will continue having foo as foo. We will not mutate foo because we will, we will be breaking the mutability, the mutability server. So how are we going to create this? Well, we will create the new versions, but in an efficient way. And we can do that using our beloved trees. We can represent our array in a tree, and we can just modify the nodes that we want to update. In our case, the B is changed by an X, and I also need to modify the parent and the root. In this example, we are reusing the A and F, but this is powerful when you are dealing with large arrays or large data structures. So this is very, very powerful. And this is built in languages like Clojure and other functional languages. Okay, there are other two techniques for solving problems that are recursion and iteration. I know you have done a lot of interviews in your life and you are familiar with recursion and iteration. 
And you remember my first phrase, forget everything you know about programming? Well, we shouldn't forget what is recursion and what is iteration. So recursion is a technique where a function calls itself. We can break the problem into smaller, similar sub-problems. The importance in functional programming is its elegance, it enhances the mutability, and also we can have pure functions. Let's take a look at this basic example. We are going to create a function in closure to calculate the factorial of n. So we define a function called factorial. Take a look at the def n. That is a way to define functions in closure with a name, unlike the fn that I showed you previously. That was a technique to define anonymous function. This is not, this is not an anonymous function. This is a function called factorial. And it will receive a variable called n. And then we have a conditional. We shouldn't forget what is a conditional. We will check if n is 0. If n is 0, that is the race case. In that case, we will return 1. Otherwise, we will apply a function to n that is called decrement. And that is a built-in function in closure, which means that we will decrement n by 1. And then we are concatenating functions and we will apply the factorial to that number and we will multiply n by that number until n is zero. This is a pretty easy way of calculating a factorial of n using recursion in closure. The other technique it's called iteration. Iteration involves using loops or loop-like constructs to repeat instructions until a specific condition is met. This has some importance in functional programming, such as efficiency and control. We can control the whole program. Unlike recursion, that is sometimes difficult to control, and also it provides interoperability. Why interoperability? Because normally functional programs need to deal with non-functional programs and non-functional programs use loops. So this is the same example using closure, but now using iteration. We are going to do a loop and this is a way to declare like private variables in closure so we are saying that we will have a variable called n, which its value will be n, and then a variable called resolve that we will initialize to one. That is called binding values in closure. Then we will check our base case if n is equals to zero. If that is the case, we will return one. Or if n is not zero, we will call the loop again with the function decrement n to reduce n by one. And finally, we update the result by multiplying it with the current n. The same example, one with recursion, the other one with iteration. Two techniques. Okay, so far we have seen some principles and I can tell you that functional programming summarized on these principles. There are other things like first class functions, but we have seen that in lambda calculus. A variable can be a function. There are other principles like high order functions, functions that receive other functions, and we have seen that in my examples. There are other principles, but we have summarized functional programming with these examples. However, a program with no side effects is pointless, is not useful. We need interactions with the outside world. And that is what side effects is about. Side effects is about doing anything with the outside world. For example, getting input from a user, writing to a database, writing to a file. We need to do that. That is our day to day. That's what we are doing every day, right? So there are different ways to do this, but first we need to do, we need to have like a bridge between our functional programming ideal world and the real world. We need a bridge 
And what can be that bridge? Well, there are different patterns for applying side effects in functional programming. There are the separation of concerns, which means that we can separate our core logic from the logic that is doing side effects. And one of the examples is functional core imperative shell. That is an architectural pattern very similar to hexagonal architecture, but is summarized to two layers or two things. The functional core, which will be 100 pure and functional, and I can handle the business logic of my program just using functions. And the imperative shell, that is just a way to interact with the outside world, to perform side effects, to write to a database, to update a file, to do things like that. And in this very simple architectural pattern, imperative shell can go to the functional core, but not vice versa. There are other patterns that are applied to languages like Haskell or Scala, like monads and functors. There are purely functional libraries that allow us to do like input output operations, but they are using just functional principles. And in closure, we have atoms. Atoms is a single way to share like a mutable state in closure, but without having race conditions or things like that. So as you can see, there are different patterns to do side effects in functional programming. All right, let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons, even though I have mentioned some of them so far. The main pro from my point of view is the concurrency and parallelism. So we have a good way with functional programming to do some tasks at the same time. Why? Because those tasks, those functions will, won't collide. If we have pure functions, we won't have things like race conditions, for sure. Also, we have comprehensibility and a declarative style, unlike the imperative style that we have seen in our object-oriented programming. The way to do maintenance will be easier from my point of view. Probably we won't spend for five days to fix a bug that can be easily fixed just by switching the functions. And for sure, we will have error reduction. What cons do we have in functional programming? I think the learning curve. The learning curve is difficult for a developer like me that have been working the last 10 years with object-oriented programming to forget the mutation to forget the mutable state. That could be difficult, but we can deal with that, right? We are developers, we can learn that. It could be also potential performance overheads, for example, when we use recursion, but there are some techniques like tail call optimization or memoization or things like that. Just take note of those patterns to fix these kind of things. Having limited mutability, as I mentioned, is difficult for developers to learn and also limited tooling. Okay, I have talked too much so far. So now I need you to help me to answer this question. Are you considering adopting functional programming in future projects? Help me with that question, please. Okay, 50% maybe, if it fits the project requirements. No, I prefer traditional approaches. Okay, and nothing for yes, definitely. Okay, let's see. 
Does it work? Do you think that works for that people that said that is not planning to adopt functional programming? I can tell you that it works. These are just some examples. Erlang is used by companies like WhatsApp. We use WhatsApp all the time. And also is used by Ericsson. Companies like eBay use Scala, even though Scala is like an hybrid a language that has object-oriented programming and also has functional programming. Twitter's backend services are powered by Scala. I don't know if you know that. NASA has used Lisp, that is the basics of Clojure. So Clojure is based on Lisp. NASA has used Lisp for mission critical systems. The Facebook spam filtering is built in Haskell. And the Cardano ecosystem is mainly built on Haskell. So my answer is yes, that works. But it is not magic. You still have bad code. You still have the, beta, the database down. You still have redundant code. And also, you will still have weird bugs. This is not magic. This will help us with a lot of different things, but this is not magic. Then, help me to discover what will be the future of functional programming in software development. What do you think is the future of functional programming in software development? Steady niche adoption. Okay. Give me more answers. Come on. All right, the winner is the steady niche adoption. Let's take a look at some of the present, because if we want to talk about the future, we need to talk about the present. This is the IOB index. This is an index that is created based on third party vendors stack or a developers work or things like that. This is representing what are the most used languages in 2023. As you can see, there is no functional languages. We have Python. We still have C, which is weird, but yeah, we still have C. We have C++. We have too many different languages. And why this happen? Because the functional programming languages are not being adopted in killer apps that is a reality that is a reality however let's take a look at these other charts this is the stack overflow developer survey this is also from september of 2000, 2023 and in the left chart you will see the most popular technologies what is this used what is being used by developers and Similar to the previous slide, we don't find here like pure functional programming languages. But there is something that is starting to be adopted by languages like JavaScript, like Rust, like C Sharp, like Java, and is they are adopting functional programming practices in the languages. I know many of you are JavaScript developers, and I know you have used things like Redux, Map, Filter, Reduce, Ramda. So we have adoption in, in those languages. And let's take a look at the right chart. What are the top paying technologies? That's very interesting. Erlang, F-Sharp, Clojure, Elixir, 
least a scala, we have like six functional or pure functional programming languages that are the top paying technologies, which means that there is demand for these languages. So I anticipate that the adoption of pure functional languages will improve with the time. And also it will improve the quality of our programs, of our software. We just need to have like killer apps adopting these languages, but also we need these languages to adapt to the industry, to adapt to things like, hey, what if I need to apply the same language to the front end and to the back end? What if I want to have universal application that is a universal application that uses the same language in the back end and in the front end? So I think the future is brilliant for functional programming, even though today we are still using legacy or object-oriented programming languages. So now we have a time for questions. So please ask me some questions. Okay, which language would you recommend? There are different languages. We have languages for the front end and also for the back end. For example, for the front end, we have things like pure script, closure script, but those are languages that, to be honest, are difficult to learn. <laughs> um, I was learning Clojure, so I can recommend you Clojure, and it's also one of the languages that have gained more adoption right now. Why do you like functional design? Well, I like that because unlike other paradigms, it is based on just some basic rules and a small amount of patterns. We don't have like one million of patterns of design patterns for applying or doing functional programming. We just have a set of rules that are very basic rules. And if you fit to that, that rules, it will ensure that you will have some gain in performance and you will have some benefits at the time of maintenance. So that's the reason I like functional design. Do you see a future where object-oriented programming languages will disappear or just will be more functional? I don't think object-oriented programming will disappear. Functional languages are not new. If you type at Google uh, languages like Lisp or Haskell, they have existed like for the 1990s or things like that, but they are gaining more adoption because now we can take advantage and leverage this. We can leverage our cores, the cores of our computer. So I don't see the object oriented programming languages will disappear. I think they can work together and we can design systems where we can work with functional programming languages and object oriented programming languages, or we can have hybrid languages like Scala or like Rust. Do you think functional programming will be key on artificial intelligence systems? Yes. In fact, there are languages like I think F sharp or other languages or functional programming languages that are being used by artificial intelligence. Again, functional programming languages are very important for performance. 
So I think that will play a key role in different systems, not only artificial intelligence, but other systems. How would you respond to a tech lead who opposes pure functions? Sorry, I cannot see that question. Let me see, let me scroll. Okay. How would you respond to a tech lead who opposes pure functions despite having a current use case where they would solve a concurrency bug? Well, <laughs> there are multiple people that is against the new paradigms like functional programming. In my experience, I can tell you that I have tried to apply functional programming in my projects, and that works. And you will see that that works when the application starts to grow. When that application starts to grow, when we add more and more code, more code, and we have multiple people working at the same time on the same application, the books are being reduced. So if the tech lead is opposing to functional programming, I will tell to that tech lead, let's try. Let's try and see what happened. Oh yeah, I have talked, I have used functional programming. I use functional programming in JavaScript, especially in a front-end application. You are not going to believe me, but I have used it in a in the in a front-end application. We were applying a pattern where some of the logic that we have to do in the front end was using functions. And it was very easy to design the system because we designed the system in a way that it works like a pipe. So one function give me an output and that output is the input of another function and so on. And it was very easy for us to understand the system. So it was a great experience. It was a, a project where we were trying to build a drawing tool which has a lot of logic in the front end to, to draw things like polygons, to, to do things like geometric operations, things like that. So in that particular case, that works for me. All right, I think there will be also other questions in Slack if you want or if you have more questions please reach out to me in Slack or put the questions in the Howdy Engineering channel and I will be happy to answer. And also, this is just an open discussion for you that are in the offices or you that are working with object-oriented programming to continue with these functional programming concepts and functional design concepts. That's it. Thank you so much for your attention and it was a pleasure for me to be with you today.